This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. And today it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Christopher McDowell, an attorney from Ohio who has had a long association with the ANS. Uh, he was editor of the Colonial Newsletter, the CNL, for a good, good while before the CNL became the Journal of Early American Numismatics in 2018. Uh, he has been the very energetic and um, uh, just fantastic editor of that. And I have to say that um, even as, as a classical scholar and uh, ancient or specialist in ancient numismatics, I find Gene a uh, just wonderful read. It's very hard for me to put it down. In fact, I look forward to every issue that comes out. It's really a fantastic uh, journal. And if you don't already subscribe to it as part of your ANS membership, I'd certainly encourage you to do so. Um, Chris is a specialist, as you might guess, in early American uh, numismatics, including uh, metals and um, as, as, as well as paper. And that, in fact, is the uh, topic of his long table um, presentation today, entitled Place Your X Here, the story of slaves and freedmen serving in the Continental Army as told by fiscal paper. So Chris, all yours. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Well, I thought I would start off by explaining a little bit how I got into this area. Uh, it, sort of, I got into it by accident. Uh, I collect Connecticut coppers and uh, research into Connecticut coppers. And uh, as a result, there was this mystery about how did Connecticut coppers get into circulation? because at this time there were no banks. And researching the individuals, I found advertisement after advertisement where they were buying fiscal paper. So if I could get my slides up, there we go. And it uh, I became curious and I thought, well, maybe that's how they are getting uh, these coins into circulation. And when we obtained finally the ledger books for the Connecticut Mint, you would see something that was very curious. On a Monday, they would buy fiscal paper for, let's say, $20. And on a Wednesday, they would sell it for $18. And this would happen repeatedly. And I thought, well, that's no way to run a business. Uh, and what I was able to finally discover is they were using their own coins from the Mint, the Connecticut Coppers, to buy fiscal paper. And then they would sell them a couple of days later for silver. And so in this way, they were able to introduce their coins into circulation uh, and at the same time make money. So these are some of the ads. So that got me interested in the topic of fiscal paper. And so I went in search of what would be sort of the Rosetta Stone of fiscal paper. And that is if I could find one that was actually signed by one of these mint owners, then I would have and sort of the proof that I was looking for. Eventually, I was able to find this note, and we'll go into uh, what this note is in a little bit. But you can see that it's signed by William Leavenworth. William Leavenworth was one of the owners of the Connecticut Mint, so this was sort of the proof that I needed that this was how they were getting Connecticut coppers into circulation. But that's not what this talks about. This talks about something a little bit different. But before we get into the, the meat of it, I want to explain sort of what is fiscal paper. So, as we all know, our American Revolution starts in part as a result of taxation. That is taxation without representation. The colonists were upset about being taxed. As a result, it would be very difficult to run a government representing those people if what you did is you taxed them. However, the American Revolution was an extraordinarily expensive war. At the beginning of the war, Alexander Hamilton estimated that there was only 45 million pounds of specie in circulation, about two pounds per person, per colonist. This war ended up costing 165 million in specie. And so there's a real disconnect between those two numbers. And so the story of fiscal paper is the story of how 
our founding fathers were able to wage war with virtually no money. So let's start off with the discussion background into continental currency. So in 1775, when continental currency first comes out, people basically were willing to accept it on a one-to-one -one ratio with the Spanish mill dollar. As the war wore on, that ratio began to slide. Interestingly, one of the things that really starts off uh, leading to the depreciation of the continental dollar uh, is the Declaration of Independence. We, we view, of course, the Declaration of Independence as one of the great moments in the history of mankind. But if you were a speculator, a purchaser of fiscal paper or notes, or you had them in your hand, what happened when the Declaration of Independence came out is you realized this is not going to be a couple of month affair. Uh, we're, we're in a long haul war with the British now. And so people began to no longer accept it on a one to one ratio. And then 1776 happened. 1776 was disastrous uh, militarily for the, for the colonists. Uh, New York fell. The British marched through New Jersey. It really looked, for all practical purposes, uh, that the war was about to be over and the colonists were about to lose. So by 1777, the continental currency slips to roughly two to one to the Spanish mill dollar. And then in 1777, that ratio dips to four to one to the continental dollar. So what was Congress's response? What did they do? Because remember, they can't tax. They printed more money. And so you can see those numbers of how much money they're printing. This money is backed by nothing other than the full faith and credit of the Continental Congress at that time, which in 1776, it didn't look very good. And so they just printed money. And then what does that cause? It causes inflation. But what else did Congress do? Well, when they started to realize that people wouldn't accept their money, they passed laws requiring people to accept continental currency. And they also begged the states for tax revenue. The Continental Congress was very weak. It had no authority to directly tax. It only received its money basically from the various states. But the various states had their own problems because remember, they're in a war over taxation. The states also couldn't tax people or they were unwilling to tax people. Prior to the war, most of these states had been, uh, the English had forbid them to print money and so freed from that restriction, the states printed money just the same as the federal government, the Continental Congress, and that was they printed a lot of it. But the emission of 1778, you can see there's 75 million uh, was issued in 1778. Here we have the French begin to intervene, which takes off some of the pressure uh, on the continental currency but it really was not enough to save it long-term from its precipitous slide. The other thing that was going on at this time is the British were counterfeiting. The British realized that one of the Achilles heels of the Americans in this war was their lack to properly finance the war in the long run. And so they put a ship in New York Harbor, the HMS Phoenix, and inside that ship were two printing presses that printed counterfeit bills day and night. And so if you were willing to pay a small sum and were willing to go behind the enemy lines and distribute fake continental currency, uh, they would give you as much as you wanted. And so this also put pressure uh, on the continental currency. George Washington in 1779 wrote that the depreciation of the continental notes has gotten to so alarming a point that a wagon load of money will scarcely purchase a wagon load of provisions. Congress issued 241,552,000 in face value in continental currency during the course of the war. 
none of it really backed by specie. They received some money from France, but really it was a hope and a prayer. If you had continental currency, you were taking a bet, and that bet was that the Americans were going to win the war. And that, in many people's mind, was a long shot. So in order to hinder the counterfeiting of their money, Congress became more sophisticated, or the notes became more sophisticated. They introduced various anti-counterfeiting mechanisms within the currency, color, for example, and, uh, and other things in order to try to preclude the British from counterfeiting their money. It really didn't work. It didn't work very well, at least. This is a, on the left is a counterfeit note, and on the right is an authentic note. If you can look at them, if you're able, ever able to look at these things carefully, you'll see that the British uh, counterfeits were just as good. Uh, they looked exactly like uh, many of the notes that they were counterfeiting. So by January of 1781, Continentals are trading at 75 to one. So if you're one of those people who got a lot of Continental notes in 1775, you've lost a whole lot of money. Private Martin, who served on the Connecticut line, wrote that all paper money stuff, all that paper money stuff uh, called money has depreciated to such a miserable state that a quart of rum cost $1,200 in paper money. So as 1781 wears on, the continental currency just totally collapses almost overnight for reasons that are too lengthy to get into here. The collapse happens very quickly. It jumps to 525 to one ratio. And then by the end of May, it's a thousand to one. So that's where the phrase not worth a continental comes from. So what is an army to do? What's an army to do that it can't pay its soldiers? What's an army to do that can't feed or clothe its soldiers? Well, it's a sad story, but the American Continental Army did what all armies have done throughout history. They began to requisition goods. This here is, this is what I call a horse note. Uh, this is a note where the army went out to a farmer and basically took his horse into the army and then gave him this piece of paper in exchange. You can see it's very elaborate. There's a lot of these notes in Pennsylvania, but if you're a, if you're a farmer and the army's come and they've taken your horse, they've taken your cattle, they've taken your pig, they've taken whatever from you and they've left you with this note, you can't really do anything with this note. And so the farmers would then go out and they would sell these notes. So these notes become a commodity. Obviously, that farmer is not selling it for the same exact amount of money on the face uh, of it. He sells it for a discount. And so these uh, enter into great speculation, these types of notes. The states also have their issue because their currency also collapses. So what happens is states begin to enter into what is called sort of long-term loans, IOUs, where people give them money and they give them these notes with interest. So this is better than cash in a way because you can at least get interest on these notes and it's sort of voluntary, but it's a way and means a method for people to at least try to preserve some of their wealth in a era in which, which there's great inflation. This is an example, another example of what I call fiscal paper, the horse note in these various state loans. This is really going to be the primary document that we're going to be talking about today. This is what I call a soldier note. So in 1780, the Connecticut is out of money and they haven't paid the Connecticut line in a very long time. And so the states begin to pay, not just Connecticut, but all the states begin to pay their soldiers not in cash because the soldiers don't want it. The soldiers don't want continentals. 
and the government does not have specie. So the government starts to give their soldiers pay in the form of these notes, these interest bearing notes. With that background, we're gonna to start to talk about the Continental Army. Specifically, we're gonna be discussing today the, uh, the role of African Americans within the Continental Army. So in May of 1780, the Connecticut line, according to Private Martin, was naked and starving. They had not been paid in a long time. They did not have clothes. They were not happy about it. Believe me, I've been a soldier and I've gone without pay through basically problems with the finance office for a week or two, and I wasn't happy. I can't imagine not being paid for a year. So these soldiers in the Connecticut line went to the parade ground and they formed up in their muster with their rifles and they refused to listen to the lawful orders of their uh, officers. And they stayed there all day. And this, was, this caused a great deal of commotion, a great deal of problems. Uh, and eventually they were convinced to go back to their barracks because as it happened, some meat arrived at camp, uh, very coincidentally, at just the time where this had happened. This is the first break in the military discipline of the Continental Army as a result of lack of proper pay. The next mutiny is the most serious of the mutinies. And this is the mutiny of the Pennsylvania line that occurred on January 1781. The Pennsylvania line, many of the men had legitimate gripes. They had enlisted in the army for a bonus, but as we've described, the amount of the bonus was basically worthless. Moreover, many of them felt that their enlistments were up. And so they wanted, they wanted redress, they wanted more money, and they also wanted to be released from active duty. And so the Pennsylvania line left their barracks in Morristown and they marched on Congress and they demanded that Congress address their concerns. They killed three of their officers. This is part of the history, just like this economic history that's not told in schools. They surrounded Congress and they held them basically hostage until Congress conceded to their demands. Now, one of the things about human nature and being in the army is if one person gripes and they get what they want, then everybody else is gonna to wanna to gripe. So soon after that, the New Jersey boys, the New Jersey line, they mutinied too. But by this time, General Washington and the officers were tired of it. They rounded up the ringleaders and they hanged every one of them. That, for the most part, was the end of the mutinies. So what was the state's answer to these mutinies? Well, Connecticut and the other states, that's when they started to pay them with these notes. Before we get into this any further, so you don't think I'm disparaging uh, the Army, my, or the Continental Army, one of my ancestors uh, fought in the Continental uh, Army, fought the Virginia line, uh, and uh, this is me out with his grave marker, and there's his grave site. Now let's talk about the Continental Army. At the beginning of the war, there was no standing army. By the end of the war, some 2.5, uh, in, in a society of 2.5 million people, about 230 men, 230,000 men served in the Continental Army. The official age for enlisting in the Continental Army was 16. I enlisted in the Army when I was 17. I know a lot of people think 16 is very young, but I can tell you that young men particularly make good soldiers because they think they're immortal. Older men, not quite the same. The average age of the uh, Continental Army was about 17 to 18 years old. Uh, this, was, this was true of most armies at this time. Older men who had responsibilities, they might enlist in the militia, stay closer to home so they could take care of their wife, children, and the farm. Where did most of these soldiers come from? At the beginning of the war, they mostly came from Massachusetts because that's where the war began. As the war wore on, Pennsylvania provided a great number of soldiers as well. Soldiers, of course, come from every colony. 
or state. Now let's focus on African Americans, black soldiers serving in the Continental Army, and also let's focus on enslaved persons serving in the Continental Army. At the time of the war, every state legalized slavery in one form or another. We think of slavery as a Southern institution, but the fact of the matter is there were slaves in New York, there were slaves in every state. When George Washington took over command of the Continental Army around Boston, at that time, the Army was integrated. Black soldiers served right alongside white soldiers. In fact, at the Battle of Bunker Hill, Salem Poor, a freedman, fought with great distinction. He, uh, he killed a British officer. He was commended by, by many people. And, and so not only did black soldiers serve with this integrated force, but they served with honor and they served with distinction. But George Washington, being from Virginia, did not want blacks to serve in the Continental Army. And so he issued rules and Congress issued rules forbidding blacks to serve at all in any capacity in the Continental Army. But what happened, there's a number of things that occurred. First, there were not enough able-bodied white men in many of these states. The states had, had a great deal of difficulty filling their quotas because there were not enough white men willing to serve. And so the states began to beg the Continental Congress to allow blacks to serve. Also, the British, as they marched through the South, told any black slave, any black person, basically, if you come across over to our lines, we will give you your freedom. And so there was tremendous pressure that began to build on Congress to permit blacks to once again serve in the Continental Army. Eventually, they gave in, but with one exception. They said free blacks could serve in the Continental Army, but not enslaved persons, only freed blacks. Throughout the course of the war, you've been looking at this slide, about 9,000 black men served in the Continental Army. And that number, as you see, is a little, little misleading because unlike whites, who generally would enlist for six months, maybe a year, most blacks who enlisted in the army were enlisted for the duration of the war. They didn't know how long that war was gonna last, but they were in it for the entirety of the war. So by the end of the war, by the end of the Battle of Yorktown, where my ancestor fought, almost 20% of the army was comprised of African-American soldiers. You can see the quotes from various Hessian and French officers as they looked across the battlefield of Yorktown. What they saw before them were mostly black soldiers. In fact, Rhode Island, which had a more difficulty than some of the other states, they had an entire regiment of black soldiers. As the war wore on, and this will become important, the army was no longer integrated. It became segregated. The blacks were then put into special companies, or in Rhode Island's case, a special regiment, and they were commanded by white officers. This is a French officer's drawing of the American soldiers at the Battle of Yorktown, and you can see a contemporaneous example of a Rhode, it's a Rhode Island soldier. So what did all this mean? Well, as I searched through all, this, all these soldier notes, I began to think, well, there must be some soldier notes that were issued to black soldiers. And how would I know, how would I know their names? How would I be able to determine who they were? Well, in the case of Connecticut, they were in their own segregated company and the list of the names of those soldiers was known. But when you dig into it, you really don't need to know their names because most slaves at this time only had one name. If you were a slave, you had no need for two names. But once you were in the army, then there was a need for two names because the army wasn't gonna pay you just under one name. So these soldiers were able to per permitted to pick their own names. And many of them picked names like Cato, Caesar, Lion, Prince, things like that. 
And so as you go through these notes, you can find, you can easily sometimes pick out these names. The other thing that's unique about, well, not necessarily unique, but is special, most freedmen and slaves, because remember I said that slaves could not serve? Well, the fact of the matter is, slaves did serve in the Continental Army. What would happen is uh, a master would take his slave down to the recruitment office, and he would enlist his slave for the duration of the war. Why would he do that? Well, maybe his son had been drafted, and at that time you could put somebody in the army in, in your place. And so he would put the family slave into the army for the duration of the war. But when he did that, he would take the bounty, the enlistment bounty, and he would keep that money for himself. So this is the front of a, of a slave note. It's a very well-worn used note because this particular person kept it for a long time. He didn't sell it. And we know that because when you look on the back, you can see every time that he obtained interest on the note, it's signed and the arrow points to his ex, because of course these people are illiterate. And so they sign their name with an X. And so when you come across these notes, these soldier notes that were issued to these black soldiers, almost all of them on the back where they get their interest or they turn the note in are signed with an X. Here's another example of a soldier note. This one is you can barely see the name there, but it's issued to Liberius Quay. This individual took on the name Liberius. And again, on the back, he signed his name with an X. This note's very easy to determine. The Connecticut notes, when they were turned in, they were canceled by that uh, circular punch mark that you see on most of the notes. This note was never actually issued. It was filled out to be issued to this individual, uh, but either he had left the army or he had been killed in combat or died from disease. But for whatever reason, this note was never issued. So it's in pristine condition. Uh, but of course, it's therefore also not signed on the back. Well, what happened to these individuals at the end of the war? Well, the British, of course, when it came time for the war to end, for them to evacuate New York City, uh, they had with them tens of thousands of blacks who they had freed, slaves who they had freed. And so they gave all of their slaves, uh, former slaves that is, a free passage to Nova Scotia, or England, or wherever it is that they wanted to go, but they permitted them to get out of what was the former American colonies. Now we get to the story of, well, what happened to those enslaved persons who enlisted in the Continental Army and fought for many years? Uh, what happened to them? Well, this becomes a very interesting story, and one that is actually connected to the Connecticut Mint. What happened in this particular case, the case of Jack Erebus. Jack Erebus was a slave whose master took him to the enlistment office, enlisted him, the master kept the bounty. Then after the war, when his enlistment was up, Jack went back to the farm, went back to his what he thought was his former master, but his former master said, no, that's not the deal. I never gave you your freedom. You're my slave. You're my slave for life. And not only that, but we're going to leave Connecticut and we're going to go to New York. So he took Jack to New York. Jack, of course, I'm sure, felt that he should be a freedman. So Jack escaped, got a boat, and went to New Haven. Now, many of the men, actually almost everyone, who was an owner in the Connecticut Mint had been an officer in the Continental Army. And they knew Jack. And they knew Jack was a great soldier and that he had fought with distinction. And the jailer came, the sheriff came, and he got Jack and he put him in the jail. Well, these officers gathered money 
and they hired an attorney to represent Jack. And he filed a writ of mandamus with the court saying that Jack should be a free man and no longer a slave. This is the Connecticut contemporary a newspaper story of what happened, the result of that court case. In that court case, the judge held that because the master had voluntarily taken his slave to the enlistment office and had kept the bounty, that he, in, he, in essence, had manumitted, had given the slave his freedom because the master knew that the Continental Congress had determined that no slave could serve in the Continental Army. And so he issued an opinion that said Jack should be freed from the jail, that Jack should be a free man. This became then precedent up and down the East Coast. Slaves were freed in Virginia and the Carolinas and other places under the same sort of theory. And so not only did it hold true in Connecticut, but it held true elsewhere. Jack then went to work at the Connecticut Mint making Fugios and Connecticut coppers. Uh, and eventually he left the Connecticut Mint, he went to New York, uh, and he lived a good life. So this is the story of the uh, fiscal paper and how you can use fiscal paper to sort of not only understand American history, but you can dig down deep and you can get a much uh, more interesting story that connects to our numismatic past uh, and to our American past. And it's sort of, at least in the case of Jack Carabas, uh, ends very happily. You can see there that uh, the, this is the newspaper report. They say it is pleasing to the benevolent mind to reflect that in this state, no person who hath through the course of the late war hazard his life in the defense of liberty and independence may by the laws of the land be doomed to perpetual servitude. So Jack was free. Well, I've uh, got, got some time here to take some questions and maybe uh, go into more depth about some other topics. So if anybody has any questions about anything that we've discussed, please, uh, now is your time to uh, ask a question. Thank you, Chris. Um, I don't know if you see in the chat there, there is a, a question from Daniel Wolf asking, how are the counterfeits detected now, today? Uh, presumably the uh, counterfeit continental currency um, that was uh, printed on HMS Phoenix, for example. Yes, well, they're, while, they're, while they're very good, they're not perfect. And you can, I think generally you'll, they'll look at the, the borders. You can determine from the borders things that are not precise uh, about, the, uh, about the notes. Uh, but at the time, if you're, you know, if you own a tavern, uh, they were very, very deceptive. Uh, today, the paper quality is sometimes different, and not all of them are exceptional. Some of them are are rather poor, uh, but and it differs from note to note, the time period. Also, many of these notes were what you call indent. The first note that I showed from 1775 basically these would be printed in a book and then they were cut out in an irregular pattern on the left hand side and so each one's numbered and it's also numbered in the book so if you have the note you can place the note back into the book and it should match uh, where it was cut out that's not all of the notes that's a very few of them but that would be the case with some and it was also the case with some of the a lot of the fiscal paper. A lot of the fiscal paper uh, was in debt, cut out of a book with a number on it uh, as well. So those are ways that you could tell uh, if it's a authentic or if it's a counterfeit. So we got a, another question from Scott Miller. Yeah. The, Okay, there we go. Yeah, the question asks about <laughs> yeah. uh, the badges of honor which Jack Erebus received. Uh, when I researched Jack, uh, I saw that he, he fought uh, with distinction in several battles along um, in New York. I think it's Stony Brook, 
uh, and elsewhere. The exact nature of his exploits uh, is not known. Uh, it, would be, it would be great if such records had been kept, uh, but in his case, there's no way to know precisely what it is that he did. Uh, but the fact is that, according to the newspaper story, uh, at least, which I think we can rely upon, he did serve, uh, he, was, he was an exceptional soldier. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why his former officers were willing to put themselves out and use their own money to hire an attorney uh, to free him. They, they knew that he was a good man who deserved to be a free man. Right. I'm assuming then that the badges are actually just sort of figurative rather than any physical thing, because I'm not aware of any uh, badges or any other um, marks of distinction that were given to people. Other yeah, than as you, very few Purple Hearts, there's one or two that are out there. Yeah, as you know, you like the Purple Heart itself was just a, a piece of uh, cloth right. uh, cut out in the shape of a heart. Uh, there were no, as far as I know, uh, actual metal badges, medals themselves, what we think of as military medals uh, that were issued to uh, anyone. Um, I don't know if you see this question from uh, Len Alsper. Yeah. Um, are there significant collections of, are there significant collections of this physical paper or does it just show up piecemeal here and there? There, there have been over the years some sales uh, that were significant. Some of these um, pieces of fiscal paper, at least in the case, let's say, of Massachusetts, uh, they were actually engraved by Paul Revere. And so those are highly collectible uh, and desirable, and people pay a, a, good be a good deal of money for some of those Massachusetts notes. Uh, in the case, the reason why I focus a lot on Connecticut is for whatever reason, lawful or unlawful, uh, there is on the marketplace a, an extraordinarily large amount of Connecticut fiscal paper, a lot of Connecticut soldier notes. Uh, New Jersey, uh, actually, uh, the state of New Jersey, even today, it's my understanding, actively uh, seeks out to repatriate, take back in any of these notes, because if they had been turned turn into the treasury, and they're out on the marketplace, that means they uh, illegally probably are on the market. Other states, uh, notes are not quite the same, uh, soldier notes and other notes, uh, but New Jersey ones are particularly difficult to find. Uh, I have a very large collection of them, and uh, I know that other people ask me about them. They want, particularly they want continental soldier notes. So people do collect them. There's, uh, there's two books uh, on on these, I think uh, one is I can't think of the name of something. There's two there's two books on it. One's I think by Anderson uh, on fiscal paper that outlines uh, uh, everything. The fiscal paper is really interesting because it can be very historical. Uh, when you deal with some of these notes uh, later on uh, after the war, it's widows uh, and orphans who are making applications back to the state. Uh, for payment, and they are issued a special note. Uh, and so they're, they're, they're sometimes very great stories. People have to um, fill out affidavits. All these papers sometimes can be found uh, with these notes. Good. Yes, um, the next question is with regard to uh, whether or not slave notes command a premium in the marketplace. They absolutely do. Uh, it, it's I've fished through lots and lots of notes to try to find slave notes, and I've found two. I've purchased one. So let's say a average Connecticut soldier note, you know, depending on the condition, can go from anywhere from $100 to $125. They're not very expensive. Connecticut's, other states are a little bit more expensive. But a Connecticut note issued to a slave signed with his X on the back, depending on the condition of that note, it could be fifteen hundred to three thousand dollars. So it all just and it's like anything else; it depends on the condition. But yes, indeed, they do command a premium. I think they're very historical. I, I'm a member of the Sons of the American Revolution, and there are no black people who are members of our 
organization, at least my local organization, which seems statistically impossible. I think if more school age people, elementary and high school uh, people knew, black people knew uh, about this really extraordinary history that they had and connection they have with the American Revolution and American history, they would feel you know, maybe a bigger part of something. I think a lot of people, a lot of us probably collect things that you know, are related to our past. Uh, and so, you know, I, I certainly wish this story were, were better known. I think if you went and asked the average American about the composition of the Continental Army, a very few people would, would be able to tell you that by the Battle of Yorktown, 20% uh, of the Army was comprised of black soldiers. Yes, this is the Eric Krauss has asked, uh, what is known of Jack's do job duties and compensation at the Connecticut Mint? This is an excellent question. Um, Jack worked on the printing press. We have all of the um, notes from the Connecticut Mint. Uh, that is, I guess we have the papers uh, for the Connecticut Mint. And so we know how much the Mint was paying its employees. A few years ago, I did a research project where I wanted to determine, you know, because you've got various people, there's no women who work at the Connecticut Mint, but you had uh, young boys, uh, you had apprentices, you had free whites, and you had free blacks, and there were slaves also who worked at the Mint at one time. And so what I did is I looked, because we have all their wage records, and I compared the wages of all those classes of workers at the Mint to determine what was the distinction. And it, was, it turned out to be very interesting. The fact of the matter is, a freed black was paid as much as a common white worker. Apprentices were paid more than basic other child laborers at the Mint. Um, but the slave, there's a couple of slaves, they were also permitted to work uh, on their own behalf. That is, when the slaves were paid, that money was given to their masters, but the slaves were also permitted to work at the Connecticut Mint and do extra work. And when they did that, that money was given directly to them, and it was given to them at the same rate as free white men were paid. I hope that answered your question. Uh, from Roger Moore, as the erosion of the value of the dollar was occurring in the British blockade of molasses, so rum was in short supply. Whiskey became a solid, can't see the rest of the question. Valued commodity and trade. I don't know if that's a question or a comment. Uh, obviously, in a, in, a, in a time in which your money has no value, people turn to other things that have more stable are more stable and that's one of the reasons why in a hyperinflation situation people turn to gold uh, is because it has a more steady uh, value so whiskey and alcohol uh, has a has a steady value whiskey actually uh, took, took the place of uh, of currency uh, it was valued at uh, a dollar uh, at a, a shilling a gallon and it held that value throughout the Revolutionary War. Uh, and so therefore, uh, it, it was a major commodity that kind of took the place of, of uh, paper money, just, just for your interest. From uh, Jamie Gray, were most revolutionary era notes sold at steep discounts to speculators, and was it the speculators who benefited when Congress finally, as per Hamilton's plan, agreed to assume the debts of the various states and were the enlisted men ever paid for their service in the Continental Army. I've read that they never were. Yes. Uh, again, we look at um, Private Martin's notes and Private Martin says that immediately after being released from the Army, many of these men did not have enough money to even go home. And so what they did is they sold the notes that they had those who still had notes, so that they could buy a set of clothes and enough money to get home. So these soldiers who had fought for years in the Continental Army at the end of the war literally had nothing. They had not, they didn't have 
uh, enough money even to get home. And so when they finally get home, uh, they, they have, they're none, none the better off financially than they were when the war began. Their bonus uh, was worth nothing. And those notes were sold at a steep discount and speculation uh, is rampant in these notes. They become, the notes become a commodity. As we know, uh, the, cons- the federal uh, constitution in part was ratified by agreements over the payment of Revolutionary War debt. These notes, they become extraordinarily valuable because people uh, speculate on them and they have you know, what would be equivalent today of millions of dollars uh, in these notes. And so part of the deal was in the United States Constitution states that these are going to be honored, not on a one-to-one basis, but they were honored and speculators uh, made out like bandits. Uh, the soldiers did not. So it was speculators in the end uh, who made the money uh, and not the soldiers. Also, our capital was moved from Washington, D.C., uh, sorry, from New York City to Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. was created in part based on a bargain over this revolutionary war debt. The soldiers were not immediately compensated. Eventually, a grateful nation did uh, compensate these soldiers, but in a different form. Soldiers were given land grants. My ancestor was given land on the Big Sandy River near Louisa, Kentucky. And so when you go in that area, there were several soldiers who were given land near Louisa, Kentucky. And you drive down that road and there's multiple signs for grave sites for Revolutionary War soldiers because they received a bounty. But also what happened when these soldiers got the bounty or their widows got the land bounty, many of them sold that to speculators. And so the reality of it is, once again, speculators and not soldiers were the real winners uh, and even that. But there were a few, who, particularly officers. If you were an officer who fought for the duration of the war, you were ham- handsomely compensated in land uh, at the end of the war, but every soldier had that. Also, uh, as the years wore on, widows uh, and aged soldiers, they began to get uh, pensions. So a grateful nation gave these soldiers pensions, but this was many decades after the war. Many soldiers had, were dead by the time the bounties and the uh, pensions came into play, uh, but their widows were also entitled uh, to widow pensions. So in that way, the nation did eventually compensate these soldiers who fought so bravely throughout the course of the war. And that wasn't just white soldiers, but also these African-American soldiers received pensions, their widows received pensions, and they received land. Uh, this is a question from uh, Tony Hine. Reference Lauren Hill's book of uh, Negroes about British loyalists granted passage to Nova Scotia. Uh, were the community of Afro Seville, I can't read that, in Halifax was established on August 15th. Canada issued a circulating dollar coin depicting Oscar. Uh, we have a $10 bill honoring Viola Davis, Canada's Rosa Parks, who bought a first class ticket to the cinema and refused to sit in the balcony. Uh, cor- uh, correction, Oscar Peterson and his music uh, are on our circulating dollar coin. So uh, I guess what he's trying to tell us is that the descendants of these individual slaves who were freed by the British and who went to Canada uh, became a uh, important part of Canadian history. And you can expect they were because it wasn't a small number. It's not like it was a hundred or so. It was, it was thousands uh, of slaves who were fee- freed by the British. From Lawrence Brown, by the end of the war, did the percent of black soldiers differ between the Northern and Southern states why do you think this was not well, I got to roll, scroll down, communicated after the war? Let me, let me look at that question one more time, the beginning part. At the end of the war, did the percentage of black soldiers differ between the northern and southern states? Yes, it did differ. Um, 
Southern states, uh, regardless of their need to fill a quota, uh, there were um, some Southern states who did not permit um, blacks to enlist in their in their line. Uh, the biggest again was Rhode Island. These New England states, uh, they were the ones who were really pushing uh, for that to happen. The Southern states, for reasons you can imagine, uh, did not want to arm and train um, blacks who would then come home and have military knowledge that they could cause a potential slave uh, uprising. And so that would be, you know, is really the primary reason uh, why most of these African Americans and uh, formerly enslaved people and freedmen uh, who fought in the Revolutionary War came, came from the Northern states. From uh, Lawrence Brown, was there any discussion about the role of black soldiers when the Constitution or Bill of Rights were written? Not to my knowledge. I mean, as you know, there is the uh, the compromise uh, over how they're going to count uh, slaves in the in the South, uh, but with regard to the role, the bravery uh, uh, that these young men exhibited, uh, to my knowledge, uh, there was there's no record uh, with regard to the constitutional and the discussions about them. However, everybody had to have been aware of it from General Washington on down. Uh, you could not escape the fact that if you served in the Continental Army uh, for any period of time, you could not escape the fact that the black soldiers were extremely valuable contributors. And then Yorktown, in essence, uh, was a very significant aspect of that. Uh, from uh, Mike uh, Markowitz, comment, in 1790, when the first census was taken, African Americans numbered about 760,000 about 19% of the population. I guess that's a comment, not a, uh, a question. Are there, uh, are there any more questions? Hey, yes, I have, I have one. Excellent presentation and thank you. Um, do we have any literary evidence or, or news articles reports about the naming practices that you talked about? Some like people choosing their own names um, the second name in particular? I, I have not read anything, and, and I think it's really interesting. I mean, if, if given the opportunity to pick your own name, what name would you pick? Uh, and many of these men literally picked the name Freedom. I think there was a basketball player who recently uh, was granted citizenship in the United States who picked a name similar to that, changed his name to like Liberty or Freedom. Uh, when, he, when I saw that story, I thought back uh, to these soldiers uh, because it's sort of an indication of what it is that you value uh, if you can pick your own name. And uh, the names that they picked, uh, you know, are names that indicate strength, vibrancy, freedom, liberty, uh, and they're really, really great names. One of the things, I've followed some of these men and some of them later on in life, one of the things that becomes difficult to track them is they change their name to more, for lack of a better word, ordinary names, but some kept their names all their life. Uh, and there's actually some uh, later on uh, wrote about their war experience. And so there are even, uh, maybe while not diaries, but there are contemporaneous accounts uh, of blacks uh, who served in the Revolutionary War. Do we have any other questions? Um, I, I just want to make a comment about last names. So in uh, the early 20th century, when uh, Ataturk, the founder of the modern Turkish Republic, insisted that Turks take last names rather than just the sort of patronymics that had been traditional in Turkey, uh, a lot of Turks at that time chose uh, names that you know evoke strength and things of that sort. So. Uh, today, for example, you'll see the last name Yildiz, uh, which is quite popular, meaning lightning. You know, this was uh, one of the names chosen, you know, by those people. My my wife's family, unfortunately, um, had as their progenitor an orphan, and uh, his name was Yetim, 
which means orphan. So to this day, her last name still basically just means orphan. Um, uh, Dr. Brown, I see that your hand is raised. Yeah. Yes, I just wanted to share when our speaker mentioned about a famous basketball player. There is actually his name is Lloyd Free. He changed his name to World Be Free. He was a member of the Philadelphia 76ers that won the championship that year. Very good. Very good. Well, Chris, i got to thank you again for an absolutely wonderful presentation. This was, uh, as always, uh, really fun and informative. Uh, just fantastic. Um, looking forward to, I, I think you have already published some portion of this, right? In uh, Gene or? It, it, in different ways, various portions of this uh, are out there. It's not together in one package um, and it's not focused on uh, the uh, African-American soldiers. Right. Uh, but I have published, for example, the, the, the issue of the pay uh, and my breakdown of the various pay, how people were being paid. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.